Hey everyone and welcome to episode 6 of Nervous Breakdowns with G, the podcast where we talk about all kinds of mental health issues. My name is Gino, I'm the host. I have master's degrees in clinical and counseling psychology. I'm a nationally certified counselor and I have a whole bunch of years of experience in the field of mental health treatment. So I have a confession to make. This podcast was really one that I struggled with. As I sit here, uh, I have started to record and deleted three or four versions of this podcast. The question that I was presented with was one uh, that was, I think was a profound one that I really wanted to talk about. I talked about, it was a, a question given to me by a friend uh, that I've known many years online, and he wanted to know about self-esteem. He wanted to know how is it that some people have bad, bad self-esteem, some people have good self-esteem. And if you have bad self-esteem, how do you make yours better? And I thought this was such a, a profound question that I really wanted to spend some time discussing it. But then as I sat down, I found myself rambling, repeating myself, lots of oohs and ahs. And I don't know, I just, it felt so forced. And uh, I realized that it's because a part of me... Uh, doesn't have a real clear idea about how this happens. That's not necessarily true. I, 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 I definitely think I, I understand how self-esteem is, is developed and how it's uh, formed and also how to improve it. But I didn't have a real clear idea of how to project that in, in a coherent way because there's so many different aspects of our human experience that f feeds into the way we feel about ourselves. You know, there, there was an interesting character on SNL. Uh, his name was Stuart Smalley. This is a guy who was portrayed by um, the, the now Senator Al Franken, and he was Mr. 12-Step. Uh, if you guys are old enough, you can remember him, but he's, he had this kind of a baggy cardigan and this perfect, like, blonde hair swept to the side, and he would sit and interview celebrities. as That was his, his gimmick on the show. But at the end of every show, he would look at himself in the mirror and tell himself these affirmations, these uh, positive things like, um, I'm, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough, and doggone it, people like me. And it was, at, at that, when I was that age, I was, I was not a professional yet. In fact, I was still in high school. And I thought that that was the silliest thing. You know, the, the idea of an affirmation where, where just by looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself things you could impact the way you felt about yourself. And to be fair, I think that the idea of that character was to be corny. I mean, he, he they, they made a movie which is, is well known for being a colossal flop. Um, and in the movie, Stuart goes and visits his family. He's got this stereotypical dysfunctional family with the addict, alcoholic father and the enabling mother, the, the uh, children that fit into the stereotypical children of alcoholic roles. And as I sat here thinking about it, I, I really felt the need to mention this character because I don't think he was wrong. You know, as I understand this field more and more deeply, I realize that there's a lot of, of, of the affirmation stuff that makes a lot of sense. But the difference is that the affirmations have to be things that you can get behind. You know, if you feel like you're overweight and you sit in front of a mirror, there's no amount of, of telling yourself that you're not overweight that, that that's going to make you think that you're not overweight. I mean, if, if you are, you are. It's the reality. You, some people have weight problems and some people feel bad about that. But what's, what happens is that it's not the idea that we have a weight problem that makes us feel bad. It's the things that we attach to that. So if I say to myself uh, a true statement, I'm 20 pounds overweight, that's not usually going to give me low self-esteem. That statement is a, a, a truth-based one. It's, it's firmly rooted in reality. If I'm 20 pounds overweight, I'm 20 pounds overweight. There's, there's not much to do about that. Well, let me, there's plenty you can do about that, but, there, but there's, there's no other way to phrase it, okay? What affects our self-esteem is when we start making value statements, such as, uh, I'm a big fat slob, or no one will love me because I'm overweight. Okay, and now we start to get into the realm of not so true statements. Is that true that if you're 20 pounds overweight, no one will love you? Is it true that if you're 200 pounds overweight, no one will love you? 
I don't, I don't know that to be true. In fact, plenty of, of, of morbidly obese people have families that love them and, and find loved ones and have children. It, it's, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that if you're overweight, you will not be lovable. And I think this is where we start to, to really get into the root of low self-esteem. I think in order to have low self-esteem, you have to be lying to yourself. And you have to be lying to yourself in a way that is easy to dispute. If you have not had good luck with relationships, if you've had one partner after another that has just not worked out, you can either tell yourself something that's based in truth, which is, uh, I just haven't met the right person yet. Or for some reason, I seem to have trouble picking good partners and I seem to pick partners that are not healthy for me. That Those types of statements are not going to have a whole lot of impact on your self-esteem. In fact, they probably make you feel not so bad. When you start to feel bad is when you start to fortune tell. I am never going to meet somebody. Or you start to uh, overgeneralize where you start to tell yourself there's no good guys out there. And you start to do a, one of several cognitive errors or cognitive distortions, as I like to call it in therapy, where you tell yourself something that's a, a lie, something that's a non-truth. And this is the part where we start to look at automatic thoughts, okay? In the first episode of my podcast, and everybody please go listen to it, it is fantastic and uh, entertaining. It's, it's the best thing you've ever heard. Go listen to it, share it with a friend. Uh, but in the first episode of the podcast, I talk at length about dating and about the impact of low self-esteem on people who are dating. So I... There was a, 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 a kind of a thought experiment that I asked people to do, and I'll repeat it for the benefit of those of you who haven't heard it, but I know as soon as you're done with this podcast, you're going to go listen to it. Um, again, this is we're going to do this with our imagination and not with our actual cell phone because they're expensive. Uh, take your cell phone, your iPad, your whatever d- device you're listening to this thing on, and hold it away from you at arm's length, and uh, just let it go. Let it drop to the floor. Um. I imagine that very few of you would do that if I ask you to uh, for, for many reasons. One, because you let it go, it falls to the floor, it breaks, you um, will have to replace it, you won't be able to listen to it or make phone calls. In other words, you have an understanding that letting go of your device will not be good for it. Okay. Now, from the time I ask you to let it go to the time you came up with the appropriate answer, which was hell no. Uh, was probably milliseconds. It probably uh, was was without thought. You didn't have to think about the consequences. You didn't have to imagine what might happen to, to when you let it go. It was just immediate. Hey, drop your phone. Uh, no way, man. Okay? The reason you were able to do this is because you're able to access lots of information about our world without thinking about it. Uh, the effect of gravity, right? We observe the effect of gravity constantly. I drop a pen, it falls to the floor. Uh a ball rolls off the table, it falls to the floor. I let go of, again, I'm not going to give a thousand examples. We understand when, when, we, when something falls, it falls, right? And the reason we understand this about our world is because we observe it constantly from the time we're born, right? We, we see things fall down all the time. And in an automatic way, we have incorporated that into our, 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 our basic assumptions about what happens in this planet. Now imagine for a moment that instead of growing up on the earth, you grew up in a space station. You would never have to be taught on the earth that letting go of something makes it fall. But the kid that grows up on the space station may actually have to learn that in preparation or in anticipation of coming back here one day. The kid may have to learn that, hey, on earth there's this thing called gravity. When you let go of things, it doesn't just float in space the way it does up here in the space station. It actually crashes to the earth. That kid is going to have to, in a conscious way, remind himself that when he comes to Earth, he needs to hang on to stuff if he doesn't want it to fall to the ground. His basic set of assumptions, the things that he's observed throughout his life in the space station, is different than somebody who has grown up on Earth. Okay? Not wrong. You know, where he's from, that makes sense, right? You let go of something, it just floats there until you touch it again. We have the same thing in terms of our observations about our, our, our own worth, okay? We observe from childhood 
the way our parents treat us, the way people around us treat us. And we develop assumptions about our self-worth that doesn't happen consciously. Like, in, in, in other words, not in the same way that you didn't have to consciously learn what gravity does because we observe it all the time. We develop thoughts about our self-worth that happen behind the scenes, under the hood, so to speak. Um, when your parents uh, provide things for you, they are showing you with their actions that you have value to them. When your parents ask you how your day was, they're showing you with their actions that you, that you, you are important to them, and so on and so forth. And as you progress through your life, and I, I'm using the word parents a lot because I, our parents, are, are, especially our mothers, are the, the primary attachments that we have as children and, and the primary place where we get our self-worth. But as you progress through life and you have your parents and your mothers asking you and caring about you and, and doing positive things for you, they, they teach you that you have a value, that you have a value to them, and subsequently you'll learn that you have a value to yourself. Now, I want to, for a moment, set aside real, real tough parents, like parents that are abusive to their children or molest their children or are absent, and think for a moment about parents who do things that are a little bit more insidious, a little bit more uh, behind the scenes or a little bit more subtle. Let's say that you have parents who never interact with you unless they absolutely have to. You know, they take care of you, they feed you, and they put clothes on your back, send you to school, uh, but don't really care how well you do in school or never attend one of your sports games, uh, never ask you how things are going or uh, you don't feel like you can turn to them if you're getting picked on at school. I want you to think about the, the way that's going to make you feel about yourself. If your parents, who are the people that at the end of the day, if nobody else cares about you, your parents should, if they don't care about you, what does that say about your value? My guess is that you're going to grow up with a sense that you have no value, that you're not very good, that you're not very worthwhile, and your value is going to be attached very much to the things that you do. In other words, if you uh, don't do well in school, you, that's going to impact your value. If you get picked on by other people, that's going to impact your sense of value. This has so much impact on your self-esteem that it bears repeating. When you develop a, a sense of your own personal value that's attached to not just value that you have because you're you, but because that's attached to the things that you can or can't do, you're basically going to guarantee that you have bad self-esteem. Now, why is that? Well, because when you attach your value to the things you can and can't do, then you're going to tell yourself some of the lies I told you or I mentioned a little earlier. If I fail the test, that doesn't just mean I fail the test. That means I'm stupid. Why? Because my value is attached to my performance. If I uh, miss uh, a shot in my lacrosse game, it doesn't just mean I missed a shot and I'll try again. It means I suck or I'm the worst and I lost the game for the team. As you can see, it starts to take it to another level. It starts to take it rather than, hey, you know, here's a, a, a time when I made a mistake or here's something I can improve on. And it starts to become about me. And so I, this is when we start to get into a philosophical discussion. You know, where is the value of a person located? Is it located in their deeds? Is the value of a person uh, related to how successful they are? So are the most successful people more valuable than, than the least successful people? Or is there something that, is there some value that human beings have just because we're, we're here, because we're, we're us? Do we have a value that exists independently of our successes or failures? I think it's a tricky one. I think that it's one that can pretty, pretty reasonably de be debated. I mean, I personally think that people have value independent of what they do. But I also think that I have that belief because of what I do for a living. You know, as a counselor, I sometimes see people that have had uh, really bad experiences or that have done really bad things. And in order for me to be an effective counselor, I have to 
regard those people as human beings. I can't diminish their worth because I won't be very good at my job if I do that. One of the most famous therapists, his name is uh, Carl Rogers. He founded the humanistic uh, school of thought in, in therapy. And he says that there are basically uh, a handful of qualities that a therapist has to have in order to be effective. And one of those was unconditional positive regard. What that means is that when the client sits in front of you, the therapist has to be warm to them and has to regard them as a fellow human being in order for that person to improve. So a lot of my personal philosophy comes from my, my, my profession. But I think that my philosophy is mirrored in many other places. Uh, in religions, for example, uh, if you are a Christian, and I'm no theologist, so if I butcher this, I apologize to all the religious people out there. Please don't, uh, don't send me hate mails, but uh, I'm doing the best I can to try to draw some connections here. Um, it's my understanding that if you are a devout Christian, you believe that human value comes from uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made for you on the cross, right? That Jesus died for, for the sins of humanity, and therefore we are valuable. Or if to take it further back, you're valuable because God created you and God loves you, right? So you have a value that is independent of your deeds. And in fact, if you repent uh, for your bad deeds, God will accept you back because he cares about you. As long as you're willing to, to consciously uh, uh apologize and really truly feel feel sorrow and feel uh, remorse for the things that you've done wrong god says okay welcome back you know you, you you're back in the club all right now buddhists have a similar belief they have a belief that people have value that exists outside of their deeds but their belief doesn't come from from a belief in a creator or a god the belief comes from the idea that Human beings have value because we're here, because we have the ability to make conscious choices about our lives that have, have meaning. Buddhists have a really interesting idea of the self. The Buddhists believe that the self is something that exists as an observer. Uh, we are mindful. If, if, if we observe the world around us, we can be mindful of the things that happen to us and make decisions about how to deal with it. If I have pain in my body and my shoulder, for example, my observer self will notice that pain. Hey, there's my shoulder pain. Uh, it's bothering me. And I can say, okay, well, I'm going to set that aside for now. I'm, I'm not going to let that shoulder pain destroy my day. I'm not going to let it deter me from the goals that I have. Um, and and as such, the 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 Buddhist has a value that exists independent of the mistakes they've made in the past. Uh, in fact, they say that all of our suffering comes from our wanting to be something different than we are, that we, if we can just accept how we are right now, uh, regardless of our flaws, of our mistakes, of our uh, good qualities, that we can live lives that are free of suffering. So I think the idea of, of value as being some, uh, disconnected from our behavior is one that's that's uh, pretty well discussed and pretty well accepted in, in most circles. Now, I know some of you are having inner dialogue. Well, what, is, what, if, what, 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 what about pedophiles? What about rapists? Do they have value? I don't think they have value. I think that uh, you know, they're terrible people. And, and that's some, somewhere where I might disagree with you. I mean, I don't think that those people who commit crimes and who harm others should not be punished. I, I absolutely believe that if you uh, hurt a child, you should go to jail for a long time. I mean, you, you, having value doesn't shield you from the consequences of your actions and doesn't make you safe to be around. Just because I think that you have value um, doesn't mean that uh, I want my kids to be around you. No, hell no. That's, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is that that person who may be ill or may be uh, uh, misguided or, 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 or have a serious problem and it may never be safe to be around people still has a value. They still have an ability to make changes and to, um, to at least try to, to improve themselves. And it doesn't mean they can be discarded. Okay, so now that we've thoroughly gone into the weeds of, of – philosophy and human value. Uh, by, by the way, if you want to read an interesting book about that, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, he goes into a whole 
tangent about the quality and how you define it, and it's something we can. It really relates heavily to what we're talking about here. But now that we've we've, we've come back from the metaphysical, we come back to the original question that we have, which is how do we improve our self esteem? And I think the central way to do that is to detach what I do from what I'm worth. To detach how I look from what I'm worth. If we can truly, truly believe that my worth is something that I have that's not impacted by how I look, how much I eat, how little I exercise, who cares about me, that what I have in terms of my value is something that is fixed. It's, it's equal to everybody else's. My value is the same as uh, the Nobel Prize winners and is the same as the guys on death row. But my behaviors are different. We can avoid a lot of the, the, the self-talk, a lot of the, the cognitive mistakes that, that in which we tell ourselves nasty things about ourselves in which we tell ourselves that because I made this mistake, I'm bad. Or because I failed at this, I am a failure. This is critical. Once we can start to look at our behaviors for what they are, once we can stop lying to ourselves and telling ourselves that things mean more than what they mean, not only can we avoid feeling bad about ourselves, but we can make more effective choices in terms of not, uh, com- repeating the mistakes going back to, I mean I, 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 I'm not the thinnest guy in the world but going back to that if, if I'm telling myself that because I'm overweight that I'm an awful nasty unlovable person there's not much in, I can do in terms of useful that, uh, there's not much useful I can take from that all I can take from that is that I'm a piece of garbage how do I how does a piece of garbage motivate themselves to improve things now on the other hand if I tell myself Look, I struggle with my with my diet, and sometimes I'm not the best at uh, controlling what I eat or or, or or limiting, not eating the bad stuff. That gives me some things that I can actually work on, some concrete things that I can change to to improve myself, to 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 have the weight that I want without disparaging my value. Same thing for for tests. If I fail at a test and I tell myself that I'm stupid. There's not much I can take from that that's going to help me pass my next test. If I'm stupid, I'm stupid in perpetuity, right? As opposed to if I say, well, I failed my test, I didn't study that much, or uh, you know, this particular subject is not my strong point and I need to work on it harder, I can actually do something that will prevent me from feeling crappy in the, in the end. I can do something that will hopefully give me some success, and I can make some some concrete choices that will move me forward towards a goal that I have. And this is where I think Stuart Smalley had it right. When he's looking at the mirror and he's telling himself, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Although it was done tongue in cheek, like it was, it was a corny way to say it. And, and, and he, you know, he was supposed to be a mockery of the 12 step model. I think that what he's getting at is that his value is something that's permanent, that is immutable, that he has value where he is good enough no matter what, that he is smart enough and that people like him. And this allows him to make choices and to let go of some of the things that he's unhappy with. If he uh, is in his Overeaters Anonymous meeting and he's feeling self, self-conscious, self he's feeling like he didn't do a good job managing his diet, and he tells himself that, then he can move forward from it instead of dwelling on his mistake and just allowing himself to let go and say, okay, well, if I'm uh, uh, always going to be this way and I'm a big fat slob and, and nobody loves me, uh, then why the hell would I, would I try to make positive changes? Uh, instead of saying th- those things, if he tells himself, well, I am good enough and, and people do like me, uh, then maybe I can give this another shot. Maybe it's worthwhile for me to uh, try something that's difficult. You know, f- the idea of self-esteem also relates to the human need to have challenges. One of the ways that we develop good feelings about ourselves is by giving ourselves re- reasonable challenges, realistic challenges that we can reasonably overcome. So... Uh, if I give myself the challenge that I'm doomed to fail, if I my challenge is to lose 50 pounds in the next month, 
um, I'm going to be disappointed and it, I'm not going to feel very good about myself. But if I give myself a more reasonable uh, challenge, like I'm going to lose a pound a week for the next month, uh, I may be able to, to, to follow through with that and be successful and say, hey, you know, I, I set this goal out for myself and I accomplished it. I did it. And I feel good. I feel like I have some power. I feel like I have some ability to change my life for the better. So for those of you that have low self-esteem, maybe a part of your improvement can be to start to identify a, 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 a goal whether that's weight loss or whether that's um, an academic or vocational, you know, you name it, whatever the goal is, and give yourself some reasonable short-term goals that you think you might actually be able to um, accomplish. You know, if you are looking for work and you haven't been able to find a job, uh, maybe a reasonable short-term goal might be to, uh, well, first of all, identify what you have control over, which is applying, right? You, You can apply for jobs for sure. To a large degree, if the job market is not good, you don't have control over that or, or who's hiring. But a short-term goal might be, hey, this week I'm going to put in X number of applications or I'm going to put in X number of hours per day this week in the, in the, um, at the task of looking for a job. And then you can take a look at yourself and figure out at the end of the week whether or not you accomplished that. If you didn't accomplish it, evaluate. Figure out why you didn't. But the idea is whether or not you do it is not has no impact on your value as a human being. So in summary, to answer the question of how we get our self-esteem, how come some people have good self-esteem and some people have bad self-esteem, the core idea is that good self-esteem, people with good self-esteem have the ability to separate their worth from the things they do. People who have bad self-esteem connect the two things. If I had a drug problem and stole from my family, uh, if I have bad self-esteem, I'm going to tell myself that I'm a piece of garbage, that I'm a piece of shit that can't be trusted. And this is the mistake. If you're telling yourself that kind of thing, it's impossible to have good self-esteem. In summary, uh, If you have bad self-esteem, go see a therapist for sure. You have to work on these issues. You have to really take a look at it and figure out where it came from. But at the end of the day, where it comes from is not super important. What is important is moving forward. Uh, Learning that people have value, that you have value that's equal to everybody else, and that your behaviors don't define who you are. Your behaviors are things that can be changed and things that you should change if you're unhappy with them. And if you're not unhappy, if you if you don't feel like you can change them, then don't. But but that is not a reflection of your value. All right, guys. As I said, this podcast was really a difficult one for me because it it, it there's so many issues related to self esteem that I think are, are are related to philosophy, to how we perceive other people, and how we um, think about where our value comes from. Uh, so it's hard for me to come up with a concrete answer. But but I think. That if we can make that core change, that core uh, separation between value and our deeds, we can all get a little closer to having good self-esteem. So guys, thank you so much for listening. This has been episode six of Nervous Breakdowns with G. Um, This is a a hobby of mine, but it's something that I really enjoy when people share and people can talk about and, and give me some feedback for. And I depend on your questions uh, in order for my show topics. I depend on your questions for my show topics. So please, if you have a question related to mental health, mood, relationships, you name it, email me. I'm at breakdownswithg at gmail.com. You can uh, tweet me at breakdownswithg or you can follow me on Twitter. Please, I I enjoy the Twitter followers. I have a Tumblr page, breakdownswithg.tumblr.com. Uh, And you can also subscribe to me on iTunes, Stitcher, or on YouTube. It's all breakdowns with G, one word. Um, Once again, guys, thanks for sharing. Tell a friend. uh, And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. So thanks a lot, guys.